um, one of your research focuses is understanding risk factors associated with um, HIV acquisition or how the microbiome affects HIV acquisition. So I know you also do a lot of research um, on infants and on babies because you're, you're a pediatrician. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to know how has your research contributed to understanding why um, infants and babies who are exclusively breastfed have a lower risk of getting HIV? Okay, so we did a study where um, we recruited babies um, at birth and collected um, uh, cytobrushes from the inside of their um, cheek, their buccal mucosa. We collected blood and um, stool. And we, all of these babies were breastfed at birth, or at least the mothers had planned on breastfeeding them. Mm -hmm. And we followed them up till 14 weeks of age, and naturally some of the mothers started um, mixed feeding, mm -hmm. or sometimes even transitioned completely to formula because they were going back to work, or whatever the case yeah. may be. And what we found was that infants who remained uh, exclusively breastfed had um, lower levels of inflammation, gene expression that was associated with inflammation in their mucosa and so we think that's probably going on in the mucosa um, throughout the upper GI tract uh, or gut, uh, upper gut. Um, they had lower levels of uh, immune activation in their blood um, and they had completely different gut microbiota. We've known for a long time that breastfeeding is important for yeah. gut microbiome. Um, but what we were able to do was relate the immunological changes in the blood, at least, with the gut microbiota, which isn't surprising because in mouse models, the gut microbiome is very important for yes. determining um, immunity. Um, one thing that's very important to note is that um, we weren't ultimately able to show that uh, this translated into increased transmission. Uh, mm -hmm. We're really using immune activation as a marker for, and, uh, and inflammation at the mucosa as a marker of susceptibility to infection. But um, we would have had to have enrolled thousands and thousands of babies because the transmission rate is so low. Yeah. To have to be power to show that. To show effect. prevention of transmission. As well, we enrolled HIV unexposed babies. That's another li limitation of mm -hmm. the interpretation because we didn't want to cause an abrasion in the in the cheek of a baby that was drinking HIV infected yeah. milk and also at the time Western Cape was giving out um, formula to HIV infected mums so mm -hmm. most of them were not breastfeeding so we couldn't really do the experiments because we didn't randomize them obviously you don't randomize mothers to, to yes. do feeding when you know that it's potentially harmful mm -hmm. so it's important to remember that. So now is the policy that because um, I know at some point there were or healthcare has advised mothers not to breastfeed their children. Then, when all this research came out, it actually in some countries it resulted in changing policy. Mm -hmm. So, in the Western Cape, have they also now advised um, HIV positive mothers that it's better for you to just breastfeed your child if you can, as opposed to yeah. using formula? I mean, it's supposed to be an individualized counseling such that, you know, if a woman is virally suppressed, um, generally we would, we would counsel them to, to, to breastfeed. Yes. To breastfeed. Um, if a woman has just been diagnosed and she may have a high viral load, I'm not sure what the, the nurses are counseling the mums at the okay. moment. That might be still Okay, risky. so it might be case by case. Mm. Yes. Although it's very difficult in a, in a massive nurse-run system like we have, when we have so many babies, it's such a busy system to really individually counsel people. But I think the general it's very hard to find now moms who are choosing formula. Um, one thing we don't know, and I'm dying to answer this question, but again, I think it might, it, it's going to require a, a big cohort. But now that we have all our moms generally on ART and they are virally suppressed, is it better for transmission purposes to still exclusively breastfeed or, or formula feed? Mm -hmm. Or is it better for the babies to get any breast milk at all, which I think is, is the answer. So I think a lot of our moms now, if they can't exclusively breastfeed anymore, they switch to formula because they've gone back to work. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's the answer now that we have uh, all moms going on ART. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
then the other part of your um, talk on Monday was talking about what the impact of contraceptives is on the vagina, specifically mm -hmm. looking at the microbiota and inflammation. So how does that relate in terms of getting being at risk of mm -hmm. getting HIV? And actually, what changes are there in the microbiome and also in the inflammation in individuals that use contraceptives? Yeah, so for a very long time, people have been worried that injectable progestin hormone contraceptives might increase women's risk of HIV. And um, as I said on Monday, I think there is um, now a massive uh, randomized controlled trial that's going to actually look at HIV seroconversion. The women randomized to DMPA, which is an injectable Depo-Provera, mm -hmm. uh, a copper IUD and a, and a The patch. It's not a patch, it's an implant. Implant. Um, but um, because all these other studies have been flawed. But in the meantime, there's been a lot of studies to try and figure out how could hormonal contraceptives alter your HIV, your HIV susceptibility. We know that hormones have a role in immunity. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we hypothesized was that it might alter the microbiota of the genital tract. Because, you know, for example, lactobacillus, epithelial cells in the vagina, slough when there's you know, a lot of, of uh, estrogen around and the sloughing of the cells provides food for lactobacillus, for example. So there's, there's definitely putative mechanisms through which hormonal contraceptives could alter the microbiota. And then because the microbiota can be so inflammatory when it's um, altered or dysbiotic, we looked at cytokines as well because we know that inflammation in the genital tract puts women at risk for future HIV. Mm -hmm. um, so we did find differences in, in this um, randomized study uh, of adolescents to three different uh, hormonal contraceptives in this case. Um, a different injectable to depo, it's called net -N, and then a, a, a vaginal combined contraceptive vaginal ring and um, oral contraceptives. Um, again, that what was so funny is that we saw alterations in the microbiota um, with both of the non-oral contraceptives, but we only saw elevated inflammation with one of them. So there's some other mechanism involved, and ultimately, we don't really know if this would, I mean, we know that inflammation and we know that microbiota is related to HIV seroconversion, but we didn't have seroconversions as an endpoint in mm -hmm. that study. So, um, it's all, it's, it's fascinating to me that you can, you can change your microbiota to a more inflammatory type of microbiota, but you don't actually necessarily have any more inflammation. Maybe it was a small sample size. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if that answered that correctly. <laughs> Um, okay, thank you so much for the, agreeing to be interviewed and we actually look forward to your results being published and we'll highlight them when they are. Thank you very much. Thank you.